straight up, three o'clock. So here we go. Now a felid, scientific name for the cats, the cat family, felidae. So we're gonna look at their biology and ecology of felids in general, uh, mountain lions in particular. The mountain lions are one of our two North American long-tailed cats. And the long-tailed cats we can differentiate from the bobbed-tailed cats. Bobbed means shortened off. And the bobbed-tailed cats include the bobcat on the left and the Canada lynx on the right. Um, we have a third bobtailed cat, which is the ocelot down in Texas. I don't happen to have a picture up there on it, but uh, the mountain lions are the long-tailed cats along with the jaguarundi, which is probably now extinct even down in Texas. If we take a look at uh, the traditional uh, taxonomy classification of the uh, cat families, uh, cat family, I should say, we'll find that there's about eight lineages. The domestic cat lineage over here, the puma lineage, which includes the mountain lions, the cheetahs, and the jaguarundi. And then we have the ocelots, uh, we have the roaring cats, the African lion, and so on, the caracals over here, bay lynx, Asian leopard cat, and the lynx lineage down here, which includes our um, uh, Canada lynx and bobcat. So uh, traditionally, we've always considered puma, cheetah, and lynx to come together. Let's zoom in on that. All are long-tailed cats. All have a fossil history here in North America. Uh, the cheetah, although we now find it in Asia and Africa, was the original the first uh, fossils of it are from North America. Graduate student Don Adams, who I worked with in my graduate days, was the one that found and documented the cheetah followed uh, fossils here in North America. Uh, we can now look at the genetics of the cats. This is one of the genetic uh, trees of cats. I draw you to your attention to a couple of spots. If you'll notice right down here in the middle, there is a uh, spot where um, there is a dividing line between two halves of this uh, taxonomic area right here. Uh, above this are the symmetry tooth cats, the derp tooth cats. That would be the saber tooth tigers, Smilodon, Homotherian, and so on, but they all went extinct. And down here about 24 million years ago, feline cats, that's the subfamily uh, that we know now is what's left there. And over here is the genetic lineage of the cats. And let's uh, enlarge that a bit so we can look at it. Who's genetically related? Well, ocelots, there's seven there, domestic cats. There's the puma lineage and the puma lineage again has the puma, the jaguarundi and the cheetah in it. So our genetic uh, look at things agrees now with our past natural history look at how the cats were related. Cougar skull, short, stout, solid. Uh, these teeth here called the carnassial pair designed for chewing and eating. These uh, canines up front for grabbing and holding and puncturing. If we look underneath, we can see that carnassial pair, the cutting tooth consists of the upper premolar four, lower molar number one. These come together like the blades of a scissors and cut back and forth to cut off stuff. And um, earlier speakers mentioned using them to cut off hair and the skin as they were trying to get into the carcass of an animal. Eye sockets are large, nose is large. Everybody talks about the smelling abilities of the bears and the wolves. Cougars are smellers, folks. They definitely uh, put a lot of faith in what they can smell and they're very good at it also. Um, now, when they're young, cougars are spotted. I stole this off the internet. If anybody ever runs into the person that claims it, tell them to talk to me and I'll give them credit. And one of the things you often hear is, well, uh, those spots disappear when they grow up. Uh, not always so well. If you see the mother here, she's still quite spotted. And if you look at this cat who was down in Colorado, a big male, he's still quite spotted. 
I think in part, whether or not they have spots may deal with cats in colder climates have to have longer hair and shed more, and that possibly might help them all get rid of the spots more. But spots can re be retained into adulthood, and this is a full-blown adult cat. Uh, this is one of David Neal's photographs down there of a big male. If you want to talk cougars, you got to go back in time for a start. Stanley Young and Ed Goldman are the two classic people dealing with the puma, the mystery American cat. And part one and part two of their books, uh, their book is must reading for anybody that would uh, deal with the subject of cougars. These books were published in 1946, or this book was published in 46. It has two parts. And I grabbed their maps because in many ways they haven't changed much. The cougar is distributed all across North America. Some people feel that there are definite um, uh, subspecies of them. Most modern taxidermists wouldn't try to uh, divide them into subspecies. And we do know the distribution goes farther north, but it does not really go above tree line. And on this side, Young and Goldman in 46, we look and they have down in South America, populations look more distinct. They separated, but they're not really, they just didn't have much data. So the puma goes from the southern tip of South America to northern tree line in North America. That makes it the largest or widest distributed uh, mammal in the Northern hemisphere. They're secretive. Now I was tracking this cougar, um, down uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and I'd been following it for a while in the snow, nice new layer of snow, easy to follow. And I'm looking out in front of me, a good tracker doesn't look at your feet only, you look out in front. And I suddenly realized that the uh, tracks, I couldn't see them in front of me. And I looked up above me and there was the cougar. He was looking at me like, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you following me? Just curious about what was going on. And one of the interesting things, I backed off from him where I shot the pictures with my telephoto, although it wasn't a real big telephoto. You could hardly see any snow knocked off the branches of where it had gone up in the tree. So cougars are highly secretive. Um, and let's see here, if we can get on past here. Oh, come on. Okay, this is another cougar I was uh, tracking up in Alberta, Canada. And this particular cougar had made a kill. And as I come in on it, you can see the elk buried right in here. But if you look closely by the tree right there, you'll see the cougar. I'm zooming in on it and I'm zooming in on it. And there you see him laying there. And important thing on this photograph is notice he's looking right at me. He's well aware I'm there. And in most situations of dealing with the cougars, they're aware of you long before you're aware of them. Uh, cougars use cover. This is one I shot up near Golden, Colorado, moving past me one day and is using the thickest cover I can. And if you're following trails and they go in the snow between the trees and along, um, that's probably a canid, wolf, dog, whatever. If the trees go for, if the tracks go from tree well to tree well to tree well, you're tracking a cougar. Here's a cat. This one is one in, um, let's see, this was Colorado. And you notice that log there, and how it's taken advantage of the log for cover. Uh, this cat came and went several times all along that trail next to the log. They're creatures of the night. Uh, Russ Morgan, Mark Penninger gave me these photographs. And, um, and you see it feeding on the deer on the left, but down below on the right, uh, there is one photograph, which they have not loaned me, of seven different cougars together, uh, which probably represents two females, the kittens, and the two females may be a mother-daughter. And it's quite an impressive night photograph of them. They are creatures of the cliffs in the high country. This cougar, I was uh, tracking it up a narrow gully, and I heard a ruckus in the bush in front of me, and it took off and went up. And uh, there it is right there on the side. Let's zoom in on that. There's the cougar. What I did was I climbed around and got on this shelf up here 
and shot the next photograph down onto the cougar, quite comfortable climbing up the cliff. Then what it did is it went on up the cliff on this route right here and exited out there while I was on the other side of the waterfall. Uh, this one was up in Alberta, Canada. Okay, cougars are mutually exclusive. A lot of people want to call them territorial, but I prefer, as does Maurice Hornacker, the description mutually exclusive because we have found situations where males are sharing the same areas, but they mark. And when they mark, that's to tell the other cougar, don't be in the same place I am today, be somewhere else. Uh, like a cat, house cat in the house, they claw up things. Here's claw marks on a conifer tree over here on this side. And um, the, um, eh, trying to get a little more light on this here. Claw marks in there, kind of see that. But a lot of animals claw trees, bears claw trees, weasel family claws trees. And what helps you differentiate, here's a nice set of tracks over here on this aspen. Bear claws are wide. Uh, even a black bear claw at the tip's about three millimeters wide and gets wider. Cat claws are needle sharp and narrow. And what you see with a cat claw is often needle drag marks in, needle drag marks out. So if you're investigating a set of marks on the trees, look for the needle marks. A bear whose paw kind of at an angle may leave both what appears to be needle-like, but you won't find them on a lot of toes. And if you look at this one, one, two, three, have very clear needle claws. There's a little one right there that you can see. And then coming out here, and I think coming out right there. So indications of needle sharp claw use uh, indicate that you're in the cat family. Size of the claw marks, height of the claw mark, differentiate the mountain lion from the bobcat. Cats are mutually exclusive. And uh, to do that, they've scent mark. Cats have cheek glands. Um, Brad Orsted showed the cat that swiped the branch twice. He said he didn't know why on his, but if you look, that cat was cheek marking in the branch. You know, I like this. People come home, they say, oh, my cat loves me so at home. I get home and he comes over and he just rubs himself up and down my leg. He doesn't love you. He's marking his uh, exclusive home area. Um, probably loves you too, but he's marking you. Okay, that happens to be a bobcat. I never managed to get my hands on a picture of a cougar doing a cheek mark. They uh, make scrapes. This cat is well aware I'm there. This one's up above uh, Golden, Colorado, looking me straight in the face. And what he's doing is making a scrape mark there. Uh, he's saying, hey, this is my area. Now, normally when the cats make scrapes, they do it with their back hind feet. Uh, but when they cover things, and maybe add something there he's covering, they will use their front feet to do that motion. Uh, Kerry Murphy, mentioned him earlier. Kerry ran the first long-term studies here in Yellowstone. And Kerry um, and I did a lot of uh, hound um, trailing of the cougars here. I'm going to go off track a minute and share one story. Kerry and I were... Uh, north of the Yellowstone, north of the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Lamar on skis. Each of us had a dog and the dogs were kind of pulling us. We came over the top of this beautiful hillside, looked over at just perfect ski and down below were two big boulders. And so we, the dogs took off downhill and pulling us and we're having the greatest time riding it down there. We came around the boulder on top, two big bull bison. They hadn't heard us coming. They went straight up in the air. I remember looking down the slope and seeing sky underneath all their feet. They hit the ground at a full gallop, went out about 50 yards, turned around and looked at us. My God, what hit us? Anyway, I'm sorry, had to digress a little bit. But that's Carrie with a scrape there. And you see that it happens to be a fairly big scrape. One interesting thing, is some scrapes have been reported four to five feet in diameter. And it's been hypothesized that females are scraping these up to put their kittens on them. I have never seen one, Carrie's never seen one, 
and I'm not sure of anybody else that's documented or photographed them, but we do get uh, reports of those, and perhaps they are the females making that kind of scrape. And of course, the scrapes they urinate on. Um, Brad Bulin was saying he's run across an article that says that they're as important visually as they are scent-wise, and that cougars may spot uh, those scrapes themselves and see that to know to come over and smell. With their nose, they can probably tell you who was there, what sex they were, what their reproductive status was. They leave other sorts of signs. And one of the things you'd expect if you're tracking a cougar is, oh, well, that tail is going to drag and I'll see a drag mark. Uh, if it drags, that's a good sign, proof of cougar. Uh, if you can't see clear prints and you're wondering, that would help you decide on cougar. However, I've seen cougars go easily a mile without that tail ever coming down to the ground. And I've also seen cougars in chases where the tail is swinging around and once per gallop, it will hit the ground. So it might be 20, 25 feet between drag marks. If you got a tail, that's good. If you don't, it doesn't prove anything. Cougar paws are dramatically different. And the front foot is more massive. Uh, the scale's not exactly the same on here, a little bit different. But what was mentioned this morning is they have toes that form a lopsided arc. Uh, there's a big toe on the inside of the foot, a little toe on the outside. There's two lobes on the uh, leading edge of what is called the interdigital pads. These are the digits, they're up between. And a good classic track will have three lobes back here. Now, the bigger, the heavier the cat, the more likely that is to smoosh down and make it harder to see the lobes. On the front foot, the uh, sides of the foot are rather straight. Now here on the back foot, what we see on the sides of the foot is they are concave. <coughs> we'll notice bilobing here on the foot. We'll notice a definite big toe and a definite little toe there also. The hind foot tends to be much longer dog-like in nature. And that hind foot, uh, I've often been called in uh, by people to investigate sites and they'll say, yeah, we had a dog here or a wolf here and we had a cougar here because they don't realize that the hind foot can be long. And the front foot is much bigger than the hind foot. I have uh, people also saying, oh yeah, two cougars here, see the two different size footprints. Now that's all left by one cougar. Now, uh, since uh, 1980, I've been working on cougar uh, identification footprints and so on. Oftentimes I've had to uh, testify in front of game wardens, uh, district, regional, forest service, personnel, um, superintendents. And so we have to be real positive. And we have 30 different criteria, clues that we look at for differentiating a single footprint of a cat versus a dog. And for instance, people say, oh, it lacks claws. Well, this does happen to have the claws pulled in. But cats, some cats will just plain show claws and other cats, um, all, almost all cats will show claws doing certain things like springing hard forward. Dogs, the bigger the dog, since the claw's on top of the nail, the bigger the domestic dog, the less likely the claw is to touch the ground. If you use a single clue like claws, you will be wrong in your identification. And I can actually tell you the percentage of the time that you would be wrong there. That's a classic cougar footprint. Wide, big, heavy animal, probably a male. We see by lobing, uh, we see the arc of toes right there, the by lobes. Uh, we can pick out the by lobing right there, that little indentation. Uh, not so clear on the three back here. Cats leave scrapes. Now, whether or not they leave a scrape depends on the um, situation they're in. If you're a big male cougar wandering around, do you leave, hide your scat in a scrape? Probably not. If you're a female with kittens, do you hide your scat? Yeah, you're probably gonna do it. If you're a female who's made a kill and you're trying to keep it for yourself, what do you do with your scat? You probably leave it exposed. So think about, if you will, what's on the mind of that cat when you're thinking about scrapes. Now this cat, you can see, he stood over here 
and that's a left front footprint, reached across over to here with the right print and pulled in the dirt from here to about there. Then he moved over here and pulled in this dirt right here and moved to this side and pulled in dirt from there. I had a situations where I'm sitting on a carcass for a cat and they're feeding and they know I'm there, they're looking at me and then they will bury it before they leave. Just tell me, hey, you stay away from my food there. Now, if you figure that this slide you're looking at here is a little over two foot across, that gives you an idea how big that cat is. That's two and a half foot of reach easily. And that was probably a male cougar. Measurements on the track would help us decide. We talked about scat earlier today. Cat scat tends to be blunt ends. It also tends to, the drier it gets to segment out. So the longer a cat feels, feeds on a given carcass and the moisture starts disappearing, the more segmented the scat. You see this pure black scat that indicates the cat was eating on animal protein, but it was starting to dry out. It's segmenting here. Um, cats, I don't know. I sort of always had the theory that their intestines could extract more moisture also, because I've watched um, coyotes, wolves, and cats feeding on the same carcass, and the coyote scat won't segment. It still has enough moisture to keep it from segmenting, although coyote and wolf scat does break. Typically, you don't see a tail on the cat scat. Here happens to be a Canada Lynx one, just for comparison, and you see short segments, no more than two to three times as long as the diameter, blunt ends and segmenting. Compare that to this coyote scat with the typical end out here uh, on the scat. This coyote uh, here was feeding on carcass where most of the meat was gone, it's mostly hair. This coyote was feeding on grass and they may do that, both cats and dogs eat the grass. It may be to scrape parasites out of the intestinal tract. Now cats will leave tails when um, they are down towards the end of a carcass and they're mostly eating bone, chewing on bone and chewing on hide. And the hair that wraps around the bone uh, helps prevent it from puncturing the intestinal tract. Uh, I often find many more chips of bones in cat scat than I do in uh, canid scat, the dogs, foxes, wolves. Cats are active predators. Motion triggers them to go after whatever might happen to be in the area. Once they make a kill, they'll transport it. This is an excellent slide of a cougar. It killed a deer. You see left, right, left, right. Here you see the body drag of the deer. This here is what's called the leg flop. Since it's got this deer by the back of the neck, the feet are pointing out here to the right. And as it pulls along, the snow accumulates against the foot until it flops and goes forward, and it leaves this very rough mark. Now this particular deer, I'll show you in a minute, but I followed it 500, and, I'm sorry, this particular cougar pulling the deer. I followed 550 yards. Just a second, my throat's getting dry. Followed it 550 yards, and I'll show you where we ended up and what came out of that one. Um, cats like their privacy. This is a willow and aspen thicket, thick as can be, and the food's taken right into the center where they can feed without anybody else um, coming in to bother them. Uh, this is, uh, this happens to be a bobcat. It was on a deer carcass, and I got there before daylight in this situation, and when it was too dark to photograph, I had one bobcat come in, he was feeding, gotten a bit lighter, and I got photos of the second one, came in, ran the first one off and fed, and then the Third bobcat came in and fed till 9.30 in the morning. And I'm setting 50 steps away from this carcass. And it proceeded then to bury the carcass. And um, I've got another photograph. I don't think I've got this show. We're standing on the other side looking straight at me and burying it. Uh, the cats bury the carcasses. Maybe it helps other animals keep other animals from finding their food. In the winter time though, burying it plus snow on top will keep the carcass from freezing solid. Uh, here's an experiment I want you to try sometime in the winter when you're camping. 
you got a water bottle, it doesn't have to be particularly warm. If you bury it in deep snow, what you'll find there'll still be water in the morning. It doesn't have to be that deep of snow either. Uh, so the snow insulates it and keeps it from freezing up. A frozen deer is something that's very difficult for the cat to get into. Uh, cats are scavengers. In one particular situation down in Colorado, and this was up uh, west of Golden, Colorado, uh, deer, roadkill deer were placed and monitored. And over a year, um, there were 19 different cougars came into that. And at that place, the average time that the cougars took to come into the deer was five to seven days. And in one case, it was 29 days after the deer was placed before the cat came in to scavenge on it. Bottom line, cats, uh, yeah, they'd rather prey on something and have nice fresh meat, but uh, they're not gonna turn down a steak, especially if they happen to be a little hungry, just because it happens to be a little bit old. Um, telling the sex, the gender of cats out in the field can be very hard. Ken Logan has worked most on teaching people how to do this in his classes. And um, it's complicated by the fact that the testes of males are not always scrotal. They are pulled back up into the abdominal, what's called an abdominal position. And therefore they may not be visible at all, except when that male comes into breeding condition. So if we look at a male, what you'll see here is the anus right here. And over here is the testes and the penal opening. Now, uh, if you get a look, you may not see anything of testings. You may not see penal opening there. Um, and the anus is hidden quite far up. So the tail, when it hangs down, will cover all of this. If we look at this cat right here, no question. I see two testes and a penal opening at that point. And of course, this happens to be a very big male. Uh, other clues would be the huge feet we see here and the wide neck and the thick head that are on that cat. Uh, we showed you this one earlier on the scams part, uh, telling the gender of the male here, big feet help, big muscles, big neck, big head. When the head is um, uh, as big as the neck, uh, that pretty well is a good sign that you've got a male. Now the female, the anus and the uh, genital opening are here in the center, tucked tight up underneath the tail. And when that tail's down, which is most of the time, uh, even when it's up a bit, it's very difficult to see those sex organs. So if we look at this animal here, there is the anus showing up. This is a female. Looking at this one going by, um, there's something caught right here but this happens to be a female, you're not seeing the urogenital opening here and you would see it if it was a male. Uh, this happens to be a Yellowstone cougar we're looking at right there. We followed this cougar for a week down in Chinese gardens in that area as it fed on a carcass, returned to a carcass every day for seven days there. Now, when um, the Cats are what we call induced ovulators. The male, when he finds a female, can induce her to ovulate. Um, oftentimes, they will drive off the kittens or even kill the kittens and then induce her to ovulate, which has to be done with pheromones, sexual hormones, and physical contact. At that time, they will mate, and they can do that 365 days a year. That means that kittens are born 365 days a year uh, in the induced ovulators. So here in pink, you see uh, from one study in Nevada, lower elevation and warmer than here. And the number of kittens at uh, um, birth month goes up a bit in the summer, but it's even fairly far across. And in blue is north of us in Alberta. And what you see is a peak, but the peak is in late August. And in Wyoming, uh, and that would be up including the area Yellowstone with high altitude, we do see a peak uh, in the summer, but what you'll notice is 10 months out of the year, this Wyoming study had kittens born. And here in Yellowstone, the Cougar Project has had kittens born all 10 months out of the year. So kittens 
uh, are a product of this induced ovulation by males uh, to give birth. Some key events in the life of that cat. Uh, the gestation period is 92 days, which um, ranges from 84 to 106 as best we can tell in the wild. Uh, to compare it, wolves are 60 days plus or minus three. You often see, hear people say, oh, wolves are 63 days. No, it's not that exact. And the detailed study on it is 60 days plus or minus three. So cats are pregnant longer than a wolf. At birth, that little kitten's about 14 ounces, and the average little litter size is 2.9, so that says three. 60 days out, most of the kittens will be weaned uh, from milk from the mother. 28 days is the lowest value that I've seen anywhere. Uh, the six month survival thing is very critical. For kittens who get orphaned from mom, if they're less than six months of age, the odds are strongly against them having a chance to survive. But if they're over 60 months, then they've got a better chance to survive. And typically they separate from mom at about 18 months. 26 months is the uh, longest record I know of of them staying with their mother. From 18 to 60 months of age, young cats are transient. They move all over looking for a place to call home. Females can first produce viable eggs at two and a half years, and males produce uh, sperm, viable sperm in three years. Photograph down here is a cougar uh, directly across from uh, Footbridge parking lot in um, Soda Butte Valley, incidentally. Cats have to put up with a lot of uh, competition from the canids and from the ursids, from the dog family and from the bear family. Let's call it the wolf family. Uh, I hope you were here this morning and saw Dan's slide about specific confrontations where cougars made kills of adult elk and were driven off by a bear within 24 hours. Well, this happens to be a kill that uh, I was watching with one of my classes. And um, right here, you see the elk in here. We got here before daylight. And uh, as soon as we could see light, we could tell there was something on it. And so we watched, there was a cougar feeding on that carcass. And it would feed a while, and then it would get on the carcass, and it would lay on its back its side, and it would roll all over it. Then it'd lay down, sleep a while, and then it'd get up and paw it open, uh, feed on it a little bit more. And all of a sudden, its head came up, and it looked uphill. And it saw the wolves coming in. And here come the three wolves. The first is a uh, 14 month old uh, yearling and he looks at the cat and he says hmm cat hmm food cat food I'm going for the food but here comes the alpha pair and uh, they're not so willing to share with the cat in the area there come the two of them and they're off and running the cat's running for all it's worth now what I want you to notice is going to happen up here you see right there Three coyotes joined three wolves and they chased this cougar for all it's worth. There was a single lone conifer uh, down below a uh, tree line and the cat was able to get to it. I'll run this again so you can see the coyotes joining the chase. Adult animals, or I'm sorry, not adult animals. That's the yearling. And here come the adults. Whoa. And watch right, right there is our coyote coming in, join the chase. So it all goes to prove that the mutual hatred of canids, coyotes and wolves, for felids exceeds the territorial imperative and wolves and coyotes are willing to cooperate. Well, with a sample of one, let's say there. Okay. Um, it looks like I didn't have one slide in there that I thought I did. So I wanna tell about one uh, particular privacy feeding situation. 
along the front range of Colorado are all sorts of old gold mines, many open shafts, and the cougars know where everyone is. I track cougars into mines many a time. And I showed you the one where the cougar was dragging the deer. That cougar drug the deer through the snow in a beeline, which I measured at 550 yards, um, over to a very steep sided gully, down the steep sided gully on the steepest way, up the other side about halfway and into a mine entrance. Well, when I got there, I had, um, I checked, there were tracks leading out when I got there. So when I got there to go in, I had to get down as tight as I could on my hands and knees to squeeze through the entrance into the old mine shaft. Once inside, it opened up to six foot tall and about three foot wide, a beautiful sandy floor, which led into a larger room with a big lake. And even though it was below freezing outside, the lake was open in fresh water. And next to the lake was the remains of the deer carcass. One of the things I do see with cougars is when they feed on uh, deer, especially if they've been pulling out hair or an elk, they will often go to water to drink afterwards. Okay, that's an overview of behavior and ecology of the cats. Um, let's see here. Okay, we're back up and um, I'll grab a little bit of a drink and Shauna or Garrett, who are our chat room moderators, have you guys got any questions there? About the uh, spots, especially in the juveniles, if you want to address if there's any evolutionary or camouflage advantage to that. I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't quite catch it. Yeah, the, the question was uh, regarding spots in the juveniles. Ah. Yep, if you want to address if there's any evolutionary advantage to that or if that's, you know, commonplace in all cats or what you think. With my great trust in evolution, there's definite advantage. Uh, other than a camouflage advantage when they're run, small and running around the entrance to the den and mom's not there, I couldn't hypothesize to any other one. I suspect that's it. Camouflage around the den entrance when mom's gone. Okay. We had a, another question on the life expectancy of a cougar in the wild. Life expectancy of the cougar in the wild from birth is very short. I've never seen anybody calculate a survivorship curve, but we do know that young died very quickly. Um, and if you happen to live into adulthood, uh, it's still kind of risky. I do know of in studies of 10 and 11 year old wild cats, wild cougars, let me put it that way. Um, and in zoos, they definitely can get up 10 to 15 years, but that's a pretty protected environment. To be a wild animal is very dangerous out there and um, never seen anybody have enough data really to calculate a survivorship curve for the cougars. Hey Jim, uh, we had a question regarding um, kill sites and your investigation of kill sites in relation to where they've been bedding or denning. Um, is there a maximum distance that you were observing? I know it usually depends on resource availability and density, but uh, is there a maximum or an average distance from the den to a kill site that you observed? For the males, they tend to um, uh, make kills, let's use the word randomly anywhere, and stay around that kill for a couple of days and then move on. They don't really den up. Females who have a den with kittens, um, they try to kill, I believe, as close to the den as they can, but it's prey availability that's important to them. And uh, one of the ladies studying cougars down in Colorado uh, with a very sparse deer population found tremendous distances that the females traveled uh, that when you initially look the distance, you'd say, oh, that's a male. And no, it was the females with a very low population of deer. Down there overall, her average home range for a female was 10 to 12 square miles. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that was over in her population high area. In her population high area, average home range was 10 to 12 miles, and it was uh, 16 to 20 for the males, if my memory serves me right. But that was higher deer population. 
relation to an earlier question um, that we had in one of the earlier sessions, someone asked about um, females in estrus uh, potentially announcing that they're in estrus. And you've explained that cats are induced ovulators. But I wanted to kind of clarify and ask an additional question, um, which relates to your information you just gave in this talk about kittens being present. Um, cats can typically ovulate every month. But does there have to be a male present to induce that, that ovulation? I'm assuming induced ovulation still applies to they have to be actually in the act of copulating for the ovulation to occur. Um, or is she going into estrus and then that male starts following her and then that induces her to ovulate if she's actually physically um, copulating with him? I wanted to just kind of clarify what kind of signs might be out there for those big toms following around those girls? Um, I do not know if the female can come into estrus on her own. I do know males uh, start following at females. That's when they spread uh, their pheromones around and start the induction process, which is to uh, cause the estrus uh, to go on or at least to get her to mate with them. And um, the induction, if you've got a female with kittens, she's not going into estrus. She's nursing, she's got kittens. The male can drive off the kittens and start that estrus cycle, I know that. Uh, is it possible for a female to go into estrus without a male? I can't answer that. Uh, I've got a couple of good books on reproductive biology of the animals. I'll start digging in to see if I can find something on that. Okay, thanks. And then it's, they may drive off a kitten, but they don't always kill a kitten, correct? The males do not always kill a kitten, but they can kill kittens. And uh, the theory behind that has always been that uh, the male, um, by, since he has so many different females, that he may not be guarding them all, and another male might slip in and mate the female. And consequently, if he kills the kittens, the odds are high that he's killing another male's kittens. Now, uh, some recent research suggests the male is capable of telling which are his kittens and that that may not hold up. And additionally, in some uh, marked population, we have evidence of kittens being killed by other females. And that may be another female that um, perhaps wasn't related. And I only know of one instance of that really being reported. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, I don't see any others, do you? Okay. Well, tell you what, it's uh, uh, 3.42. We're gonna take a good 15 minute break. We'll get going at uh, four o'clock and I'll talk about pets and the pet trade then, which really um, doesn't sound like wild cougars, folks, but in our search for cougars and cougar verification, it's a critical thing that you know about the pets and how they play into all the reports of cougars across the United States. So uh, for a 15 minute long bathroom break, let's head out for it. Take care. <laughs> 